We um, are continuing our series this summer, Fan or Follower, True Grit. Um, I hope it's a blessing to you. If you miss a Sunday, there's CDs out on the side or you can watch online. But what I'm really kind of thinking a lot about is, is what is it that makes us unique? Um, when Vanessa and I were in Pentecostalism, we had, I, I remember going to a church and it said, we are distinctively Pentecostal. That's cool, you know, when you walk in, you got to, uh, when, when we were Baptists, uh, and I don't know if Pastor Tom had this, but in, in seminary, I had a whole class on the Baptist distinctives. And um, none of these are bad things. But it occurred to me one day that all of these distinctives, none of the, none of the distinctives was love. And every denomination has their distinctives. And I started thinking like, for us at Faith Bible Church, you know, we're not trying to start another denominational movement around certain distinctives, but we certainly need to have something that makes us unique as a people of God. I guess it was about, man, 15, 16, 17 years ago. Do you lose track of time? It's all, all really, it, it was some time ago. Vanessa and I were new missionaries in, in Vietnam. And uh, I was studying Vietnamese and we were starting a house church. And my son Ryan will remember these, these good old days. Um, were they good old days? <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we're living in this communist country, and God intersected my life with this man, and his name is Bai. And uh, he, he was teaching English as an English professor in the university that I was studying Vietnamese, and we instantly connected, and we talked, and he started, me, uh, started working with me, and we started a house church in our home. And this is all undercover because the police are always looking out for what you're doing, and and uh, he, he, he was a wonderful guy. And I, I, one day during the week, I thought, I need to talk to him. And this is before we were allowed to have cell phones in Vietnam. And so um, he had told me, he goes, uh, I live over in Tanda. And in Vietnam, it's a little different. People say, you, you say, where do you live? They, they tell you your neighborhood. And the city's divided up into districts. And every district has these... Um, wards and every there's neighborhoods in the wards and so you can if you know where someone lives you can kind of find them so i get on my scooter and i drive over to i go over the bridge and i come into tanda and i i'd never been there before and i go oh no because it was kind of like a soviet designed area neighborhood where it was these huge plain ugly apartment and i'm looking and there's like seven eight apartment buildings and each one has like eight floors and each floor has you know 10 units and i'm like how am i going to find them but that's not the worst part by means seven now you say, why would someone be named seven? Well, in Vietnam, oftentimes you are named as the number of person you are in the family. So in Vietnam, everyone calls, calls me An Shao. An Shao means brother six because I'm the sixth person in the family. Well, so you're in a city of 10 to 12 million people. How many sevens do you think there might be? <laughs> And I'm like, what am I going to do? How am I going to find him? So there's this lady in the unique aspect of Vietnam. Everybody's always selling food or different items on these little push carts. So I went over to one of these buildings just randomly. And there's this lady selling things. And I go, excuse me, do you know seven? She goes, well, uh, would that be gospel seven? She said, you mean Tin Lan Bai? That's right. And she says, yeah, he's in that building right there on the fourth floor and the third. Bit. So I went, I met him. He's like, you know, hey, how are you doing? Having a good time. And I was driving home on my little scooter through the traffic of Vietnam. And I started thinking, what are they calling you? 
I've discovered something, and it's not just unique to church, but you do it. You have these names for me. Yeah, you, you call me things. You have these adjectives to describe me, and, and you know, we do this at work and at home, and we have these little nicknames for people, and we're calling people things, and we're kind of associating them with what we see in their lives. And it struck me, like, what do people see in me? What are they calling me? And then I thought, you know, this morning I'm going to talk to you about what did Jesus say they ought to be calling us? Look at John chapter 13, verse 33 through verse 35. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Father, so grateful to you that you preserved your word, that you make it clear for us, and it really is so simple. Um, but I tend to make it hard. And I just pray that you would speak through your servant. I, I do now consent to be your vessel, and I want you to speak through me, and I pray that each one here would con consent to hear your voice and what you want to do and say. But Lord, don't let us leave this place the same. Let our lives be impacted and transformed. Lord, our heart's desire is that people would see Jesus in us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. He starts off and he says, little children. Um, Jesus didn't have any expectation that unbelievers were going to act like saints. But why are we, you know, this is the whole expectations thing. I was thinking about why do people get mad at each other? Well, they have expectations, Right, and we don't meet. I don't meet your expectations. You get mad at the preacher, and and your spouse doesn't meet your expectations, and you get mad at your spouse. And and I I was thinking about it. Some people have these expectations for God, and that's why they get mad at God because God doesn't feel so inclined to do whatever we want. There's a wonderful country music song, and there's a lot of good theology in country music. There's some bad theology in country music, but what's that? Who's the guy who wrote the song about or sang, sings the song? Thank you, Garth Brooks, right? Thank you, Jesus, for, or, for the prayers that you didn't answer. <laughs> yeah, something like that, right? Unanswered prayers. <laughs> he says, little children. He says, little children. Uh, he's speaking to those who have been born of God. I want to put a, a wall up to protect myself. And don't we put up these walls to protect ourselves from being hurt and injured? But when did God love you, friend? When we were enemies. Maybe we didn't see ourselves, but he said, listen, when you were the enemies, I loved you. And that is the kind of love that dwells within us, and that's the kind of love he wants to release through us. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. We've made it all about what we do and what we don't do. We've made it about a cultural war that everyone knows what we're against but doesn't know who we're for. And Jesus tells us it's all about how we love him and others. Look at Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. What's he saying? He's saying the sum of the law, if you will, is to love him with your whole being. And to release that love to others. To be an authentic disciple of Jesus Christ isn't about whether you drink or don't drink, dance or don't dance. It's about how you love. And it's not the feeling, right? Don't make me sing. 
Don't make me do it. You fall asleep, I'll sing, man. That'll wake you up. <laughs> but it's these actions because what do we need to come to? Love does. We got to release ourselves from the, the concept that love is really about how we feel because then we become very self-centered, self-centered and self-absorbed thinking we do what we feel like doing. And that's the world we live in. We do what we feel like. I didn't do it because I didn't feel like it. I do it because I feel like it. And Jesus is calling us to release his life that's within us to a life where love does to love him, to respond to his love, to be overwhelmed by his incredible love. Because what? That's the proof of the cross. The cross is the undeniable evidence that you are the object of his love, that he went there to, to enjoin in your suffering and to take what you deserve so he could give you all that he desired to give you. And he says, now that I've taken that love and you've opened your arms, if you will, to receive that love, keep your arms open so that you can release that love to those that you live around. Frankly, some people are easier to love than others. And loving your enemy seems absolutely humanly impossible. I mean, I would rather hug a cactus than some people. Because cactus are less dangerous. But what is he saying? He says, the same kind and quality of love that I have for you, will you release that love? Will you love your neighbor? But here's the thing about most of us. We're always looking for loopholes. Right? Um, why does any law in Washington take 500 pages? Have you thought about it? Because there's a lot of attorneys who are getting rich writing loopholes into laws that favor certain people. And you and I are no different. We're looking for loopholes. The Jews heard Jesus said th say this, and they said, well, then uh, who's my neighbor? Because they had narrowly defined neighbor, not as the person who was living next door, but the person who had the same beliefs. So if you're a Baptist, uh, only Baptist. And within the Baptist, there's certain kinds of Baptists. And so we kind of, and, you know, got it about Bible versions and Baptists or Methodist or Episcopalian or whatever denominational reference we had. And we said, those are my neighbors. My neighbors are very narrowly defined to the people I like. And Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, and the Jews are listening to the story. So the Pharisees are like, oh, we're going to be the heroes in this story, most definitely. And he points out the priests, and then he points out the Levite, and they go, the religious leaders, they're the hero? No. But the dreaded, the hated Samaritan is now made the hero in the story. The outcast was the only one who had empathy he had an emotion, but that emotion didn't stay an emotion. It was stirred to action. And he came and he bound up the wounds of the man who had been beaten and robbed and left for dead. He takes him to the lodge to make sure he's safe and secure. And he says, listen, whatever he needs, I'll pay. He agape. Who's my neighbor? Really, in the purest sense, my neighbor is all of humanity. The people I like and the people I don't like. He's calling us to be a people who share his love. Who see that other people are hurting and need their wounds bound up. And then he says, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Now, why did Jesus put that in there? Because we would have defined love the way we wanted to love. And if I ask you... Do you love? Oh, sure. But it's not the way you want to be loved even. It's really, or the way you want to love. It's the way you have been loved. 
That's why it's so critically important that we live in the consciousness of how Jesus loved us, how deeply he loved us, how richly he, he loved us, how enduring his love is. He says, listen, as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So not how you define love, not how I define love, but how Jesus actually loved. How does he love us? When does he love us? You can spend all your energy arguing about who's right and who's wrong and never love. He who is loved lives in you so that he might release his love through you. We say it often. It's a good mantra. He died for me so that he could live in me. But that is not the end. He lives in me that he might live his life through me. He loves me and puts his love in me that he might release his love through me. We have to quit treating this verse and so many others like it as though it was somehow optional. You don't have to worry about any of the other commandments of God if you take this one serious. People will come to me and they'll say things like, well, preacher, don't, people do need the law, don't they? I said, well, unbelievers do, for sure. And the spiritually immature who don't respond to the life of God, they, they could probably benefit from it. But the person who's overwhelmed by the love of God does what? Releases that love. They don't even have to think about it. We don't have to sit there and go, oh, commandment one, commandment two, commandment three, commandment four, commandment five, commandment six, commandment seven, eight, nine, ten, or all 600. You'd go nuts trying to remember. He says, just love. Love the Lord your God with all of your being. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you don't have to even think about the commandments. It doesn't make the commandments bad. It just means, listen, we don't need him because he gave us something that's inside of us, his own life within us. And as I've loved you, love others. But it's not going to happen until we forsake our self-love. Because the greatest problem almost all of us have is we love us more than anything else. Vanessa, uh, Vanessa and I were in Vietnam for 10 years. And I'll be honest with you, it was, it was stressful, pressure, but I loved it. I, I loved it. Vanessa, not so much. And um, you'll have a hard time believing this, but I was completely insensitive to how it affected her. Because that's a shock, right? But I was actually going through life, having, you know, having a good time, doing my thing, and just totally oblivious to how this was affecting her. So, you know, through some different circumstances. Anyway, we end up at this, at Lee LeFaber's office uh, for counseling. It wasn't the first time. And there were many times we went to counseling. That's why I always encourage you, if you need help, get counseling. Because I've done it. We've done it. More than once. <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> That's all you need to know. So we're sitting there, and we had separate sessions because we were still uh, not working it all out. And Lee LeFaber, in his beautiful, gentle, kind, sensitive way, if you know Lee, you know I'm lying. He says, you know, Tim, the problem is you don't love your wife. And he just has this demeanor. I mean, if you know him, he just blitz blunt. And I said, oh, yes, I do. He goes, no, no, you don't. And I go, no, I do, I really do. And he goes, no, you love you, and you love your ministry, but she's way down on the list. And I thought, hmm. Hmm. Well, why wouldn't you love me? I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> Just kidding. But I sat there and the Holy Spirit was like, he's right. And it really resulted in a complete change of ministry and everything we did and how we, because I realized, listen, I was doing what I wanted to do because I wanted to do it. And that's not agape. Agape does not seek out its own but it seeks out what's better for the other person. And Vietnam might have been fine for me, but it was not fine for my wife. 
And agape meant taking into consideration what was better for her, regardless of how it made me feel. Because that's what agape does. He says, he says, I want you to love the way I love. And we need to forsake our self-love because we will never love others until we quit loving us being the preoccupation. And if we had altar calls here, the altar should be flooded. Because we're a people filled with self-love. We're self-absorbed. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The distinctive of the Pentecostal church might be being Pentecostal. I can't remember the whole Barapsis thing that we had in the Baptist distinctives, but the Bible is a sole authority and... Come on, you guys could help me out, but, you know, baptism by immersion, and we had the whole thing. And listen, this is what I'm telling you. My heart's desire is that Faith Bible Church would not be known for anything but that we loved. Jesus said, by this, all people, the unbelieving people, the people on the outside, the people on the outside are looking in, they're looking in, and they're saying, hey, and this is the harsh reality we as believers have to accept. The unbelieving world is looking in at the believing world and they're not seeing love. They're not experiencing love. They're seeing uh, a stale moralism, but not love. And he says this, by this, all people know that you are unique as a follower of Jesus Christ. Very different than a fan. But a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have love for one another, it means, listen, doctrine is not the argument or the heel that we're going to die on. Love is what we're going to live for. How does the world to come, come to discover that we are Christ's followers, his disciples? What is it to make us unique as his? We've made it all about different doctrines and behaviors. But Jesus says the unbelieving world is going to look in at us and say, man, there's something going on at faith. And the question for us is, listen, are we children of God through faith? Jesus did this incredible love out of the incredible love of God for all of humanity. What did he do? He died on the cross to pay the redemptive price for us. And he offers to each and every one of us this beautiful reconciliation, this beautiful salvation, this beautiful redemption. And he says, listen, it's not by what you do, but what I do. And he says, listen, he goes, I want to invite you into my family. And it's true for everyone here. You might be sitting there going, is that true for me? Absolutely true for you. Unequivocally true for you. For every single person. I never have to worry when I go to India or Thailand or Vietnam, when I'm sharing the gospel, whether it applies to this person or not. It's there. It's all there. It is true for them. It, and, and my prayer and my, my, my plea in my heart is that it would be true for them that they would take it from the realm of for them and make it true of them, hey, that they would become the children of God. He's speaking to you if you're his child. He said, and he calls you, he calls little child. It's the idea, he goes, my precious one. He's speaking to us as followers of Christ, but we need to remember that not everyone is a child of God. And I was thinking about how Jesus spoke like hard words to people. Like sometimes you think maybe he was trying to shock them out of their apathy. Look at John chapter 8, verse 44. He says, you are of your father, the devil. Ouch. No one sits there and goes, oh, I'm a, I, I'm a child of the devil, do they? And he says, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Ouch. But what I was thinking, you know, I don't want you to go to the negative side of it, but I want you to go to the, we do the desires of our father. He goes, that's why we're here. We're, we're, we're genetically connected to him through the new birth. He says, you've, through faith, you become partakers of the divine nature. And he says, listen, when you look at the unbeliever, don't be shocked. And why is Christianity as a cultural movement always shocked that sinners sin? Right? We have protest movements. We have boycotts. I mean, one time there was a boycott of Disneyland. 
because of some special day they were having. I'm like, hey, listen, don't be shocked when sinners sin. What we should be shocked by, what we should be really shocked by is when Christians don't live out who Christ has made them to be. We should only be shocked when we don't live true to our true selves because through the new birth, we receive a whole new identity, a whole new way of living. And he says, listen, this is true of you. This is who I made you to be. He says, yet in a little while, I am with you and you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. <clears throat> I want you to see something real quick is that the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was not an accident. It was not, a tr you cannot attribute it to some strange fate, but it was the divine will of the Father for the reconciliation of mankind. You're sitting here this morning and you say, listen, I don't know. I don't know. He's saying, no, know this, that Jesus purposefully, intentionally allowed himself to be nailed to a cross to take the punishment, the suffering, that all that we deserved. Isn't this beautiful thought that because he took and became what we were, we could come and receive who he is? He who knew no sin became what? He became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. A lot of people, mostly Christians, have trouble seeing themselves as righteous. And they say, I don't see how you can say all Christians are righteous, that we've been made righteous. Maybe we're only clothed righteous. Maybe we only appear as though we were righteous, but how could we be righteous? Because we look at us and we look at our behaviors and we say, eh, not so much. He's saying, listen, your righteousness doesn't come from a change in behavior. Your righteousness is what you are made to be through the new birth, through new life in Jesus Christ. But Jesus loved you and I enough that he became what we were so that we could receive all that he is. It is the divine will of the Father for the Son, for your redemption and my redemption. He knew he was on a journey to the cross and would rise to the Father to come again as a conquering king. He says, and a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Hmm. Now, you're thinking the Jews only had ten commandments. Well, Moses came down on the, on the tablets. He had, he had 10 commandments. But if you read through the scripture, I don't remember exactly how many, but there's 635 or 65. I don't remember exactly the number, but some 600 rules and regulations to being a good Jew. No wonder they were meticulous, right? And no wonder they were angry at Jesus. He wasn't following their rules, and Jesus says, listen, you're never going to be the rule keeper. So I'm going to narrow it down. I'm going to bring it all concise. I'm going to bring it down to one point. He goes, one commandment. Listen, Christians, there's only one thing you got to worry about. And I say, you really don't have to worry about it. You just have to release it. But only one thing you have to focus on. And what's that? This new commandment. I give it to you that you love one another. Now, here's where we get it all wrong. Mostly in the Western world, we think of love as what? <sighs> I've got that love and feeling. <laughs> I'm only singing to embarrass my children. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, what do you live for? To embarrass my children the way they embarrass me. <laughs> no. Um, what do we think? We said love. And what do we think of? Immediately we think of an emotion, a feeling. People fall in love and they say, oh, I got that ooey gooey feeling going on. And we say, I don't love anymore. Why? Because we don't feel anymore. But an interesting thing in the scripture, when you look at it, he says, I call you that you agape one another, that you give yourself selflessly and sacrificially for the benefit of others. 
Jesus gives you and I one command to agape, to give ourselves selflessly and sacrificially. He narrows the whole of the law down to one thing, and that is to agape. And you agape whether you feel like it or not. What I've discovered is that we can become very narcissistic, very self-absorbed, very centered in what we feel and what we want and what we desire. And Jesus is calling us to be an other-centered people who function, who live, not just in our emotions, what we feel, but selflessly and sacrificially giving ourselves for the benefit of others. And the hard part for this is us Westerners, we, we come to this thing and we think it's all individual, We come in life, we come with our friends, or we come with our family, we come to church, we hear the message, we go, we do our own thing, and then maybe we come back next week. But what Jesus was envisioning was that we as followers of Christ, we as true, authentic disciples of Jesus Christ would come and realize that each of us are interconnected to one another. We don't simply come to get something, we come because we want to agape one another. And we agape on Sunday and we agape on Monday and we agape on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. The whole of life for the believer, the life of the believer's mission, if you will, is to give themselves for the benefit. And this is completely contrary to the way our world works. Because most of us live and recognize we live in a world that's really all about doing what we want to do because we want to do it. And I started thinking... What have we made Christianity into? Last night we were having dinner late and, you know, we were talking about some things and, and I go, ooh, that just drives me crazy that Christianity has become about money and jets and possessions. How does that grieve the heart of God? Christianity is about one distinctive Love. And it's not about you and me defining another church or another denomination or another group of people and criticizing what they do. I, I, gosh, it sounds horrible when I say, I don't care about that. That's not my concern. That's really, and what I mean is that's not my responsibility. As a shepherd, my responsibility is for us. And we can't do anything, and, and, and we like to focus on what other people are doing wrong so that we are distracted from what we aren't allowing Christ to do through us, aren't we? And we're saying, he's saying to us, listen, it's all about love. We argue and we divide over doctrine and denominational preferences. And all the while we do it, we're violating the very simplest command that Jesus gave us to agape one another. Galatians 5.14. For the the whole law is fulfilled in, can you see it? One word. (laughs) Wow, isn't that interesting? The whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes I say, poor neighbor. (laughs) Right, you say, because if you don't receive the abundant love of God for you, and you have some twisted idea of how God loves you. And a lot of people have this idea that God is a puppeteer pulling the strings on everybody, making you do this and making you do that. And then you're, they, 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 they think, well, he's a punitive God who's just waiting to smack you like some kind of perverse delight. When you mess up, he gets to smack you upside the head. And so well, how do you treat everybody? You think there's conditions on the love of God. And so you're always going around smacking people upside the head. Always trying to get people straight. Always trying to get people right. Think about all of the ways that we divide and separate uh, over being right. Like, you know, we want to say, I'm right. Have you ever had a good argument with your spouse over who was right? I bet you you didn't. Yeah, you may have had a lot of arguments over who was right, but you never had a really good one. Why? Because it's not about being right, is it? It's about being agape. Jesus did not insist on being right all the time. A lot of times people said crazy stuff to him, falsely accused him, 
abandoned him. He didn't stand on the ground of right. He stood on the ground of love, of agape, of giving himself for the benefit of others. So the question I want you to ask yourself is not do I have the right doctrinal statement, but do my neighbors see the love of Christ in me? Do my coworkers see the love of Christ in me? Does my spouse experience the love of Christ flowing through me? Do my children experience agape through me? You can't self-generate this kind of love. Aaron was talking about the communion. He was talking about, you know, if, if you approach God and say, well, I'm going to do these things and then God will love me, you're never going to be at peace. You'll never have done enough. But he says, what did he say? We love him because he first agape us. And he's saying, listen, because I've loved you, now go out into the world and release. It's not generate this love. It's release this love that he has given to us. In Matthew 5, Jesus says some very difficult things. He says, love your enemies. How impossible is that? How do we want to, what do we want to do? I'll tell you, I don't want anyone to be my enemy, but sometimes it feels like people are my enemy. And what do I do? Bible church. Those people are different. Those people love, and it's not the feeling, it's the agape. I've done this to you before. But it doesn't hurt to do the same mean thing twice, right? If your spouse, if your children, if your neighbor, if your coworker had just one adjective to describe your life, what would they choose? There was a time when I know Vanessa's first adjective wasn't love. Might have been driven, frustrated, angry, whatever. Listen, my, my purpose in life is not to be the best preacher in Bernie or the best any of that. All I really want is to experience the love of God and to release the love of God. I want my wife and I want my children to know that Jesus loves them because they saw Jesus' love working through their dad, through their husband. One adjective. They knew Bai because Bai was preaching the gospel everywhere he went. And listen, make no mistake about it. People, they got names for you. But is it love? I am fearful, my friends, that too many times we're just clanging symbols. Can I share with you more, one more verse? I know I went a little long today, but you might not be back next week, so I got to share it with this week. <laughs> See, I know you. <laughs> First Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. Look at this. If I speak in the tongues of men and, and of angels. Listen, you say, is there anything wrong with speaking in tongues? Absolutely not. Wonderful gift. But have not love. I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have a prophetic powers to know and foretell the future and to be able to discern what's going on, is that a bad thing? No, it's an awesome thing that the Spirit of God gifts us. But if I have that and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. You see, friends, we've made Christianity a lot of things it isn't. 
We've argued, divided, separated, got angry, laughed <laughs> over stuff that in the eternity won't matter a bit. But love is unique. Because look at verse 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Verse 13, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. We have to decide if we are going to consent to letting the amazing and awesome, incredible love that God has for us to flow through us. That might mean you have to give up being right. Think of all the arguments we could avoid we just gave up that little right to be right. But I'm right. No, that's not the question, is it? It's do I agape? And he doesn't leave us to define what love is. And when you look in Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, it really isn't about emotions at all, is it? but a conscious choice of the will. So, you may not know your nickname, but be sure people got them for you. Your spouse, your neighbors, your coworkers, you know. They got one adjective. One adjective to describe your life, what will they use? Maybe most important, have you received God's love for you? Knowing you're loved is probably the first step, right? You got to know God loves you. And the Bible declares it really from beginning to end, if you read it right. He loves you. You are the object of love. And he says, here's my love. Will you receive it? You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, my sin's too great, or this has got this problem. Or that. Put it all aside. See it all on the cross. God loves you. And all you do is you simply say, Jesus, I receive that love. Come live in me. Because he's already done everything he needs to do. Are you ready to release his love for you to others? I don't know. We got the wrong page on the wrong slide on there. <laughs> yeah, just take it off, Michael. Thank you. I've, that's a technical difficulty from someone who had a technical. I probably used an old slide. Forgive me. This is what it's about today. If you don't, you can't. You can only give what you have already So that's this morning's. Amen.